Hi, welcome to Celebrating Culture. Part of our mission is to recognize groups that honor our veterans. This episode, we're gonna showcase the Big Easy Wing. The Big Easy Wing of New Orleans was started a few years ago at Lakefront Airport. They have given rides to the Archbishop on Good Friday to first responders and World War II veterans, and their stories get national attention. The World War II Museum in New Orleans honors our veterans all year round, but on special days such as Memorial Day, D-Day, and Veterans Day, they have noteworthy events that we're gonna showcase. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Hi, welcome back to Celebrating Culture. We're here at Lakefront Airport at the Big Easy Wing, and I'm with David Capo, who is the wing commander. Is that right? Wing leader, wing, wing commander. Leader? Yes, sir. Okay, so you're the commemorative Air Force. Tell us about it. The Commemorative Air Force is a 63-year-old organization that is essentially a flying museum. The purpose is to restore to flying condition as many warbirds as possible. But the Big Easy Wing now is only three years old, and we're one of the newest, but we're also the fastest growing wing in the country. You are standing in a 13,000 square foot hangar that was condemned by the Lakefront Management Authority. And so we turn this into a state-of-the-art, beautiful hangar. We've got about 100 members, and they're from all walks of life. About a third of those are pilots. And we uh, did a show last week in Opelousas, Louisiana. It was our very first revenue-producing show. We make money two ways, through donations and through selling rides and merchandise. We had our very first revenue ride, and one of the oldest wings in the Commemorative Air Force, the Gulf Coast Wing, oftentimes known as the Texas Raiders, they were so excited for us. And they could see our enthusiasm as that airplane taxied back up to the ramp. Everybody was thrilled. We actually made a dollar after having the plane for almost two years. It was just, it was an exciting time. We have a really good group of people. In Hammond, Fifi showed up. You were involved with supporting a lot of the bigger bombers that come through. That is the Air Power History Tour, and they travel around the country, and it's been a, a very successful week there. And they brought Fifi the B-29, which is one of only two flying, and the only flying B-24, Liberator Diamond Lil. You guys kind of took something nationwide. You know, the Archbishop flew, and now yeah. July 4th, tell me. One morning, I opened up an email, and one of my counterparts took his pastor up right after the pandemic hit, and they just privately blessed the city. I said, what if we could do something like that on a more public basis? So I picked up the phone and I started calling people, and they were like, are you serious? Is this a joke? A priest, a rabbi, and a pilot get in a plane, come up with a punchline. And I said, maybe I am nuts. Well, pursued it. The Archbishop had just gotten over the COVID virus and had been cleared to fly. We had a, a young lady, Rabbi, and we said, let's go for it. Our plane was ready to go. It was checked out. I contacted headquarters and said, I want to take a priest, a rabbi, and a pilot up. And they were like, huh? They were like, okay, it sounds interesting. And what happened was when the Archbishop was in the air, he blessed the city with holy water that came from the River Jordan, but he also made a special blessing to the first responders and healthcare workers. It lit up the entire aviation community. All of a sudden, major organizations were doing flyovers. And so what we did in honor of 4th of July was to actually fly first responders, not just fly over the first responders, but fly three of them. And of course, I had to fly three hardy souls who were willing to get into an open cockpit airplane and do it. Well, Sergeant Dillon is definitely a hardy soul. She's wonderful. We're here at the Lakefront Airport, and I'm with Sergeant Dillon, who's with the National Guard and just took a flight for first responders. How was yes, it? Yes, it was fun. It was so exciting. It was my first time flying in one of these type of planes. Um, I was a little nervous at first, but I knew I had a good pilot, so I was I was confident. Now you're doing a lot right now. You, you actually, so you're in the National Guard, but you just graduated. I did! Go Suno! <laughs> I, yes, I'm a social work major. You are doing the testing, so you've used yes. those skills. Yes, to... yes, just calming people down, hearing them out, you know, when they were afraid of the actual test itself. And you're a medic normally? Yes, I actually work at East Jefferson Hospital. Now, what was the flight like? Oh, it was wonderful. When you get to just really see the city for what it is at that level, it's really beautiful. And for the other first responders and the way you represented them today? I'm happy to be a representation of them. Um, I'm literally, literally like a small portion of them. So to the EMTs, to the nurses, to the people who work in the emergency room, security guards, 
police, firefighters, everybody, like I'm proud of everybody. Despite everything going on with injustice, I am still happy to wear my uniform and represent who I represent and just be proud. Good luck to all your Thank career. You. Thank and you. And so I appreciate much. all you do for us. The yes. whole state and the country as well. Thank I mean, you. What a life of service. I try. I try. I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. So I'm very proud to be a member of the Air National Guard. Thank you for your service, Dad, and you're, happy 95. You're, you're most welcome. Uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you very much, everybody around here. Thank you, David. Thank you, our pilot. Thank you, Thank you Bill, for your efforts in trying to get make this happen. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. You're welcome. Our photography crew, everyone. Thank you very much for your help. One of your pilots is named Evil. Tell me about Evil. Evil. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Van Cook. One of the best things about being in the Big Easy Wing is all the wonderful people I've met. People like him just don't exist. He is amazing. We're here with Lieutenant Colonel Cook, who is actually an F-15 pilot, but also the pilot for the Big Easy Wing today. Because there's three pilots, right? That's right. And then today you were flying for July 4th. So what was that like? It's an honor. Anytime we get to do, you know, I've always got, gotten to do things more with the military where we do flybys for events or, or you know, NASCAR races or football games or 4th of July events, Memorial Day. And now getting to come over to the civilian side and get to do the similar thing and keep on serving, it's awesome. I was very a strong volunteer to do today's flights. You're also in the military, so you actually were part of the jets that, that escorted the B-52s. Right. Yeah, and so that was, you know, another one of those times. Anytime you can show off for your home crowd, it's, it's awesome. The whole unit was really proud of getting to do that. And, you know, getting to show off for the city of New Orleans was something that was, just, you know, a team effort. And it was great to have the active duty and the Air National Guard working together, both part of Louisiana, with those guys coming out of Barksdale and us here in New Orleans. So we flew by Superdome, we flew by the base, we flew by uh, several of the hospitals in the area. So David, if people want to learn more, or if they want to donate, BigEasyWing.org is our website. We have a Facebook page as well. We're also going to start flying on Saturdays, and we'll have you know, two to four flights a day, and you'll be able to come up and buy a flight on board the airplane. Well, David, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. And stay tuned. We'll be right back with more of Celebrating Culture. Celebrating Culture is brought to you by Awe News. Awe News also produces New Orleans Insider Tours, which are 10 self-guided tours of New Orleans and Louisiana. To download the apps, all you have to do is point your phone at the flow code in the camera mode, and you're ready to really experience Louisiana. Hi, welcome back to Celebrating Culture. We're coming to you today from the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I'm with project manager Tom Gibbs. Tom, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me today, I appreciate it. Tom, it seems military history is part of your genetics through your parents. Yeah, actually my mom was on the ground floor of the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress, and growing up in the D.C. area, you know, they would take me to all the Civil War battlefields and all the museums and things like that, and I can remember as a little kid walking across the field at Gettysburg mimicking Pickett's Charge, and heck, I even saw Saving Private Ryan when I was like 11 or something, so I had the inspiration from my family, and I, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. Now, you started out as the D-Day Museum. I was 13 years old when this museum opened. I know it was an incredible story to get this off the ground. It was a great moment of pride, of support from the local community. We had Senator Ted Stevens and Senator Dan Inouye come down here and, and actually when they saw this building and that we were just covering D-Days and it was this small narrow focus, they said, you guys tell a great story here, you have to do more. And those were the words really that launched the whole effort to have us redesignated as America's official National World War II Museum. When you come in here, you get to see really from the 1930s, the beginning of the war, you can really learn a lot. You almost have to plan to come here. Here we are now with almost eight buildings completed on campus, spread out over about three city blocks, including a hotel. There's a lot to see and do here. Just the first couple of exhibits, if you stop and read everything, you're gonna be in here for a full day.
I enjoy being Italian. You have a great exhibit on just the Italian campaign. Yeah, we have the Italian campaign. We talk about the North African campaign. A lot of Americans don't realize that we fought the Germans in North Africa, that we fought them in Italy. You know, I think you can thank Saving Private Ryan for that as sort of the seminal moment that Americans latch on to. But reality, we had been fighting the Germans for two and a half years when we landed on Omaha Beach. So as you mentioned, the Italian campaign preceded that. You know, you can go through our arsenal of democracy and learn about the Japanese incursions in the Aleutian Islands, you know, American territory. You get a really good sense coming to this museum of the worldwide connotations of this conflict. So here at the National World War II Museum, we do a lot throughout the year to honor World War II veterans. We honor them every day, in fact, but throughout the year we have wonderful ceremonies such as our Memorial Day ceremony. On Memorial Day, you have the missing man table. I mean, that's a really honorable ceremony you guys do. Yes, we bring in a local ROTC group and they do the missing man table where it's essentially a military tradition to honor the people who you cannot dine or celebrate or commemorate an anniversary with. It's a very powerful moment when they do that ceremony because it really brings home the loss that it's not just a person or a number or a statistic, it's someone who is cared for, who has served in this branch, put on the uniform, and is no longer with us. 2019, we had our D-Day 75th anniversary, which was just an unbelievable institutional effort by this museum. I just want to highlight the fact that we had a ceremony here on campus for 60 World War II veterans, and it wasn't just one day. We had June 3rd through June 8th. You know, we had documentary premieres, we had special lectures, we had different World War II veteran guests come to talk about different topics. We did a hero's welcome for all those veterans here on campus that morning. I know we ushered about 60 of them past cheering crowds of visitors here to help commemorate that day. We know that our guests came here and were able to learn a lot about the war, but more importantly, they were able to learn about the war from someone who was still there. And that's just important, right? We only have so many of those days left. And this is all while half of our staff was overseas managing two cruise ships going from Amsterdam all the way down to Calais, Le Havre. We brought 30 D-Day veterans back to Normandy for the 75th anniversary. It culminated in a really beautiful morning on June 6th when the entire tour group got to go to the Normandy American Cemetery right there at Omaha Beach. I tell you, especially knowing what would happen in 2020 with COVID, looking back and what we did for those veterans in the 75th anniversary, it's really special that we were able to do that. We have our Pearl Harbor ceremony. We have in the past gotten together and done battle anniversaries such as the Battle of Iwo Jima, the Battle of Okinawa, Battle of the Bulge. As much as we can try to program throughout the year, we will do that to honor these key dates and anniversaries. You've had some fantastic people here over the years, and one I really enjoyed was Charles McGee. Charles McGee is a great friend of this museum. He's come down to the museum's air show several times. One of my favorite memories as an employee here is on Free Student Friday, we had Charles McGee under the wing of a P-51 doing a little circle lesson for some school kids and talking to them about flying and aerodynamics. It felt like how Native Americans pass along their oral history. It was a very special moment. Another gentleman I enjoyed meeting was the candy bomber. I think that's a great story. Mr. Halverson, his story is really epic after the war and just how he carries himself and the type of human being he was. But you see how he acted after the war was really rooted in that one act of flying those planes over East Germany to try to bring some hope to those people who were under that occupation by dropping those candies over the city. It just must have been an awe-inspiring sight and just an unbelievable thing to be a part of. Something so humanitarian after the world's been torn apart. You actually went out to one veteran's house for his 110th. Yes, it just brings a smile over my face talking about Mr. Lawrence Brooks. He just turned 111 on September 12th, 2020. We put together an amazing celebration for him. The Honda Aeroshell aerobatic team came. They had four North American T-6 aircraft. We had the victory bells come and sing the national anthem for him and happy birthday. Happy birthday, Lawrence. Yes, We're happy so birthday, excited. handsome. <laughs> happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday to you and many more. Uh, we presented a cake to him. 
We had his family there. There was a police drive by. There was just a number of things that we did, but it was really, really fun because I know Mr. Brooks has been in his home all year with everything going on. And for him to get out on his porch and to see all these people, the community, the museum involved, uh, helping to celebrate his milestone birthday, it was just remarkable. And you personally have gone around interviewing a lot of veterans. I walk in the door here as a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed 23-year-old, and they hand me a credit card and say, go fly around the country and talk to the people you've been reading about. I will never have a job as cool as that. I look at it with more importance each year. Every year that goes by, I realize the significance of what I did as just sort of a young, naive 20-year-old. But I completed about 320 interviews, and it was really an invaluable education for me. The life experience and the stories that you hear and the knowledge that you gain by listening to these veterans is incomprehensible. Was it different hearing somebody that was involved in D-Day versus say the Battle of the Bulge versus the end of the war? I would say so and I think some of that has to do with the conception of these events after the fact. You know D-Day is looked at as that really key critical moment so of course if you interview a D-Day veteran it's going to be a heck of a story. The World War II generation was strong in more ways than just getting off a boat and doing these invasions. I mean they carried it with them the rest of their lives. And I'm with Ubert Terrell who was actually a World War II veteran from D-Day. Ubert, welcome to the show, and my honor to have you as a guest. So I, I parachuted into occupied France at night from England five times before D-Day, picking up information that our commanders wanted. And then D-Day, our chief engineer on the troop carrier C-47, we dropped paratroopers at 12 o'clock on Sunday night before D-Day. What did you feel as you got ready knowing that this was the beginning of D-Day? You don't know what's gonna happen. You, uh, the bombers had been going over, getting shot up, shot down, before D-Day out of England. It was a journey that I surely wouldn't want to take over, go again. Sure. You and your brothers are such heroes to America. And we're at the exhibit to the Battle of the Bulge. And I'm with Risa Williams, and both her grandparents fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Risa, welcome to the show. Thank you. Reza, the Battle of the Bulge was a very influential battle in the war. I mean, it was the turning point, and if we had lost that, who knows what would have happened. Knowing how important it was with your grandfather being there, what is it like being in a place to learn your grandparents' stories? It's amazing. It's very humbling to walk through here and for their stories to come to life. We hear of the things that they've said, and we hear of the heartache and sadness and, and fear, but to walk through and see it come to life, it's humbling. Your grandfather laid cable? He did. He was a communication sergeant. He laid cable and he did it through freezing weather, through the worst conditions, but he got it done. Now I understand also he became almost like a therapist. There was a story that he told. It was actually the very first day of the Battle of the Bulge. They were not expecting what they had walked into, obviously. When they started hearing gunfire and bombs and everything all around them, he was in a foxhole, him and two other guys. And one of the men in the foxhole started panicking. So these guys, particularly had never seen combat before. So when everything started happening, this man who was probably only in his late teens or early 20s started panicking. He was crying and sobbing, weeping. He was curled up in a fetal position. And my grandfather was, was trying to comfort him. And then he said he had done everything he knew to do to get his friend up and going in the middle of this battle. All of a sudden he just slapped him <laughs> and he started, he started yelling at him and saying, you know, calling him names and trying to snap him out of it. And before you knew it, the guy was, he was like snapping out of it and coming out of it and realizing what was going on. And that's the moment that he, this man was actually able to stand up and fight. And so it, in the midst of war, having no idea what was gonna happen to him, he was doing his best just to care for the man next to him and see to it any way that he could that this guy survived. And so to me, that was an incredible, incredible thing. 
They're called the Great Generation. At his memorial, it was very touching what you had to say. And how is it to understand what the Great Generation did? For my generation, at least, understanding it is just making a choice to recognize that there are people out there that risked everything they had so that someone who wasn't even born yet could be free. Taking the same spirit that these men had, they ran into a situation where they knew that many of their lives would be lost, but they went rushing in because they believed in freedom. And I think that we should have the same perspective, run into freedom, run into whatever it takes to see that these men didn't risk their lives for nothing. See to it that we take the baton and we run with it also. I think that we have a responsibility to take what these men did and to really shine. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. We're here today in Lake Providence, Louisiana, and I'm with Mr. Lee Broussard. Mr. Broussard is a military hero. Uh, looking at a book he suggested here, reading Down to the Sea. Not only was he on the Missouri when Japan surrendered, but this book here tells the story of three ships that got sank in a typhoon that were part of a fleet that he was with. And we're gonna hear his story. Mr. Broussard, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Where were you born? Oh, in New Iberia. South, down south in the Iberia. And how did you end up in Lake Providence? Well, my wife was from up here, so all her family was here. So when I retired, well, she dragged me up here, and <laughs> I've been st stuck up here ever since. <laughs> we were on the way to help my caught. My caught was landing in the Philippines, and we got tangled up in that big typhoon, and a whole lot of those smaller ships, destroyers and such, they were running out of fuel. That's probably why those three sank. They probably ran out of fuel. Those waves were 100 foot waves. The radar up there was 110 feet off the water from the water line. And when the ship would go down in the belly of the wave, all the radar showed was water. You know, the waves were higher than the 110 feet. Three destroyers were lost. We didn't know about it till next day. They didn't have time to send in an SOS and that, well, we couldn't have done anything for them anyway. They went down during the night and the next day when they counted heads or ships, three of them were missing. But the whole fleet was damaged. I mean, some of them, the stacks had been lost. All those planes on the battleship, well, they were gone. And well, was there a big party on the ship, though? I mean, did you guys really feel like like went in the Super Bowl? You know, it was real refined. I mean, there wasn't any yelling or hats thrown in the air or nothing. I guess everybody was just glad it was over with. But there was no, no kind of celebration, nothing. It was real quiet, real dignified. Now, I'm sure the officers, when they got below in the mess hall, the, the wardroom, wherever, I'm sure they had their toddies, you know, and, and celebrated. But as far as the, the crew, the ship, it was real quiet and refined. So Mr. Broussard, you kept a diary. Okay, it wasn't very big. From the day I got on the Missouri, every day, every night, I'd write a few words in that diary. I was gonna give it to the museum in Hawaii to put on the Missouri itself, and I offered it to them. If they send me a ticket, I'd hand deliver it to them in Hawaii, but <laughs> they wouldn't do it. So I gave it to the World War II Museum in New Orleans. Mr. Broussard, I want to thank you for being on the show, and I want to thank you for your service to uh -huh. America. And then what a the great generation, what you guys went through, it's just well, unbelievable. You know, uh, the way things are nowadays, uh, I hate to think what would happen if we had to go through that again. General MacArthur expresses a wish. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world, and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. In the air show, you've done a lot of air shows over the years. Yeah, so I, I love air shows. I became a big air show dork working at this museum. There's nothing that compares. I know when I got this job, my mom sent me a picture of me at eight years old with a Blue Angels helmet on at an air show. 
and she said, my God, it's like come full circle for you. But to me, there's nothing more exciting than putting a bunch of World War II metal up in the air and letting it fly around and letting people hear the sights and the sounds and smell the smoke coming out of the engines and giving them that up close experience. My mom came to the air show one year and she wanted to get on the B-17 because my grandfather was a radio operator on B-17s. I'll tell you, my mom was about like halfway into the fuselage and she was just full of tears because it helped her understand what her father went through. The Higgins Hotel just opened up. I've been to Rosie's there. That is a great place to go visit. The Higgins Hotel is really cool. It is the only Art Deco themed museum hotel in the United States. It's named after Andrew Jackson Higgins, of course, the boat builder who made New Orleans famous for their wartime contribution. It's got 220 rooms. It has suites. It has a nice restaurant. You mentioned Rosie's on the roof. So this is a great thing for the city to have this rooftop bar that gives you this great view of the Mississippi, the bridge, downtown. It's a fantastic place. It complements the museum perfectly. If you're traveling from out of town and you're coming here to stay and you want to visit the museum, that's the place you got to stay at. Now, if someone does want to know more, is there a website they should go to? Yeah, absolutely. www.national, www2, the number two, museum.org. I have loved it. I've been here four times this year. This is a phenomenal museum and every year it seems I come here more and more just because I'm realizing I'd like to take it in in little increments because you can really learn so much by just spending an hour at one of the exhibits. Absolutely. In the future when our Liberation Pavilion goes up which covers the last sentence of our mission statement, what does all this mean today? We're going to have eight buildings on campus. It's going to be completed. The brick and mortar will be done and it'll truly be a multi-day experience. Tom, I want to thank you for being on the show and I really want to thank everything you guys have done to educate people, but also the way you honor all veterans of all wars. It's just beautiful. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to say a few good words about the museum today. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more of Celebrating Culture. Hi, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Culture. Awe News has interviewed hundreds of people and produced dozens of episodes for local broadcasting of awesome people doing great things to inspire us all. If you'd like to watch a specific interview, please visit our YouTube channel and subscribe. Hi, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Culture and are inspired to get involved in projects that honor our veterans, whether by attending the World War II Museum or helping the Commemorative Air Force or taking a ride in a vintage airplane. Have fun and remember to thank those who have sacrificed so much for our freedom. Your handle is evil. That's right. Have you always had that? Yeah, so when, you, when you're a new fighter pilot, you know, you do a few dumb things enough and eventually people tell stories about you in a big, you know, they call it a naming ceremony. And so people will often ask me why I picked it. You don't get to pick your call sign. You know, somebody else picks the call sign. It's usually a story that if you actually heard the real story, which we're not allowed to tell you, uh, then it would be embarrassing. So, you know, my, my, my family was all excited when I got my call sign and, you know, hey, did you get named? Yeah, I got named. Is it cool? Yeah, it's pretty cool. What is it? Evil. And they're like, huh. You know, they kind of give me one of those. They've, they've since embraced it because I've been evil now for almost 20 years, so. Um, I'm thinking evil Knievel, evil Cobra. Yeah, yeah, there's some of that mixed in all of that. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna just assume that maybe there's an evil Knievel story that you got there, to hand. There's a few stories that went into that, <laughs> yeah. So uh, thankfully, they're, they're not for public consumption. It's probably good for me. But and you did tell me you were at Mountain Home Air Force Base. I was, yeah. Which is, the, which is where he tried to jump the Snake River Canyon. That's right. So there may be more of an it, evil you know, story you, there. You know, you never know how many places are, are, are when we start getting into the small world of aviation and people that do crazy stuff, it becomes a very small world. All right. <laughs>